Welcome to the Future of Hospitality podcast. I'm Luke Palladino, and today my guest is James Trees, one of the first chefs responsible for establishing and influencing the dynamic food scene off strip in Las Vegas, shifting the focus from the world of celebrity chefdom to talented local chefs. James was born and raised in Las Vegas. His culinary career began as a teenager at the Mirage Hotel and Casino on the Strip prior to attending the Culinary Institute of America. He then rose through the ranks under chefs including Michael Mina, Bradley Ogden, Eric Repair, Heston Blumenthal, and spent several seasons behind the scenes with Gordon Ramsay on Kitchen Nightmares in Hell's Kitchen. He opened his first independent restaurant, Esther's Kitchen, offering seasonal Italian in the downtown Las Vegas Arts District. And most recently, he opened El Solito Posto, featuring refined Italian and Ada's Wine Bar in Tivoli Village. This conversation is so great because James explains the challenges he faced opening his first restaurant, Esther's Kitchen, and how he celebrated his first one-star Yelp review by opening a bottle of champagne with his staff. I love that. James laid the foundation of his success with hard work, dedication, and mastery of his craft. Before we get into our conversation, I want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Meta Hospitality, who provides strategic restaurant consulting, planning, and tactical business expansion services. They are concept creators and industry pioneers, providing unique, exciting, and profitable food and beverage concepts for entertainment districts, hotels, and casinos. Meta Hospitality is a development solutions company. Also, a quick shout out to the team at Mainstage.pro, who is powering all of my creative content, including this podcast. James, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Luke. James, you are now one of the most influential chefs in Las Vegas. You started it all with Esther's Kitchen downtown, which is rustic Italian food. And then you moved on with El Solito Posto, which is, in Italian, the usual place, which is refined Italian food. And then on with Ada's, which is a wine bar, which, which is, features chef-driven food. Can you tell me about those concepts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, it really started when I was 15. I got to work with a really good chef named Luke Palladino, oh. who um, was a fiery young lad who uh, yelled and screamed and ripped my head off, and I appreciate every minute of it, and uh, made me into the chef that I am, um, and injected passion into what we do, and hopefully... Um, I'm still injecting that passion into my cooks uh, at Esther's and Al Solito and uh, at Ada's. And I really have to say thank you for the opportunity that was given to me at such a young age. And um, I don't think I would end up being where I am today without the guidance that I had. So thank you so much and thank you for having me on. Um, for Esther's, Esther's is what I call seasonal Italian soul food. It is the food that I grew up dreaming about. It's the food that we were putting on the plate at Onda. It is the food that is the archetypal beautifulness that Bradley Ogden wanted to translate onto the plates. And it is the refinement that we saw in some of the technique that La Bernadette uses and the sauce making skills that I learned there. Um, some of the playfulness of uh, my time at the Fat Duck and uh, some of the technique driven things that we learned from Gordon. It's everything. It's all of my journey as a chef and all my passion put into a little tiny restaurant and our only goal there is to make sure that people have fun and make it happy. That is what Esther's Kitchen is. So I call it seasonal Italian soul food, but it's my soul. It's where I come from, it's who I am, and it's how we built it uh, that makes it so special. Uh, with all Solito Posto, um, it's my, my next kind of venture into neighborhood cuisine. And now we're in a different neighborhood, so that means a different thing. We actually started with Ada's, um, and Ada's was an Italian restaurant. It was a little 30-seat restaurant, and we were making everything. We were making the bread. We were making all the pastas in-house. And it had originally started as an ice cream and pizza concept. 
But what we were finding is that there was this massive gap in the market for thoughtful restaurants in Summerlin. And I think that we were able to fill the gap, but we were unsuccessful because we had a larger audience to feed than the restaurant could handle. And so we took that as a note as we opened all Solito. The jokishly funny version of the thing goes that I was working on the line or expoing, I can't remember which one, and the owner of Tivoli Village came in and they had been going through some lease negotiations with Brio and he just took the keys and put them on the table and we're like, go take a look at that. Because we had this little 30 seat restaurant that had just shut down a Brio. And we knew that we had the ability to fill the restaurant from 4.30 to 8 o'clock. But that was not what was needed in order to make the business successful because we were putting so much uh, labor into it. Um, and it was a labor of love, but we were losing that battle. Then we got into also Loto Posto. We ripped everything out of the Brio space, rebuilt everything. My partner Jeff and I, uh, Jeff is a visionary when it comes to putting things in the right places. And that's Jeff. Jeffrey Fine. Jeffrey Fine. Yeah, an amazing guy, local guy. Um, and I'm really happy to be partnered with him and the Lev Group. Uh, and this is our first large restaurant together. I think Ada's was a really good learning uh, space for us together. We learned how to work together. And one of the great things about a partnership there is that if you don't know who your partners are at a very deep level and what they stand for and what they're looking for, then you can't work in a way that is going to be copacetic. And that's where you end up with problems with partnerships and chefs end up with the story, the I got fucked story. Every chef has the I got fucked story. We all do. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't setting myself up to make the same mistake that my mentors and my previous chefs had done because I had seen how they had made deals and they lived up to their end, but somehow their passion and their hard work wasn't enough for somebody else. And I think that our craft is devalued by other people and I want to make sure I chose the right partners. And I really do feel like I've made a good choice. I agree. I think it's important to choose the relationship over the opportunity and make sure that it really fits. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tough lesson to learn at times when you don't, when you don't do so. And um, well, I'm glad I had a positive influence on your career. You did. <laughs> and I can, I can certainly bask in the glow of your appreciation here. Uh, which would be fun for me, but not for our listeners. So let's <laughs> let's move this uh, this this on. And so, what was it like opening your first restaurant, Esther's Kitchen? I mean, there's no preparation that you can have. You can open as many restaurants for other people as you want to, or as you need to, but it will never prepare you for opening your own restaurant. When you're never a real owner until you decide to take the money out of your pocket for your rent to give it to someone else for their rent. That's skin in the game. Like not only just skin in the game, but to the point where like when we were opening, I was paying my GM at, like so he could pay his rent and make sure his family had food on the table as I ate ramen noodles and could not even afford to feed myself or pay my rent because I was waiting on an SBA loan that I was hoping my mom would sign her house over for, right? This is the kind of thing that we don't talk about in the restaurant industry enough is in order to get the freedom to do what we do at Esther's, I had to leverage my entire family's life savings and just for a roll at the dice because we all know that I could have opened Esther's and no one would have showed up because the truth of the matter is is that in this business you can do everything right and I see it all the time I see people who pour millions of dollars and build great teams and have everything going for them they have the right space the right time and the whole thing falls flat 
We've all seen it. We all know those people. And we all know how that feels to watch. And I was just hoping. I mean, like, you have to not only believe in yourself at a very high level, you also have to be willing to push down all of the fear that goes along with opening. And when I talk about fear, I'm talking about three day long panic attacks, like, sure. like full on, like not knowing, you know, what you're going to do. Like, how are you going to pay your mom back all the money that you lost? Like, those are the things that like the people, like when they say like, Oh, well you just opened your own restaurant. They have no idea. They just have no idea it's, what you're talking about. Yeah, it, it creates a whole new level of value and appreciation for it and to uh, really feel what it's like to, to be on the hook for that. Yeah. And then the first two people I hired were two of my best friends. I hired Alfio, whose dad was the person who fed me all that beautiful Cucina Pavara, Italian-style food. He's from San Remo. And... That's where I got my foundation for what those flavors should taste like between you and him. Like that was where that, you know, foundation was built from. And then my best friend and then my other best friend, Casey, who was one of my, I, I joke around and I say, oh, he's my drinking buddy in high school. But he's my best friend in high school. And many nights when I called in to work at Onda, the reason why was me and him were out <laughs> drinking till four in the morning and I would call uh, I, I knew it back oh, then. I didn't oh, know I who did. you were with, but I knew what you were oh, doing. Oh yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I put him on the spot <laughs> when you came in. I was like, yeah, he's the reason why I wasn't there. And, um, and, and like when you have those two people backing you up, like some people say, don't go, don't hire your friends. Don't go into business with family. The only people I would go into business is my family because I trust them so much. And the only people I want to hire are my friends because at the end of the day, I know that they're going to run through a wall for me because they believe in what I'm doing. If I tell them that the promised land is on the other side of that wall, they're not going to come in, clock in, work eight hours and hopefully get through that wall. They're going to come in a couple hours early and start banging their head through that wall with me. And that's what opening a restaurant is like. It's like banging your head against a wall hoping that on the other side of that wall is the promised land. And luckily enough for myself, my family, and my friends, um, Esther's is just that. We, it is the unicorn restaurant because the people who are there want to work there because there's no way of working in a space like that that is so small and we do so many covers and we work so hard and we don't cut any corners and we do all that and we do it for 2,000 people a week. Like, that's a real thing. And, and it is that restaurant, and you have to want to work there. And people come in, and they're like, oh, yeah, I want to work here. I'm like, okay, cool. You want to work here? Where are you coming from? And they're like, oh, well, I went, I worked at Robuchon, or I worked at, you know, Guy Savoie. I'm like, cool. Two hours in, you can tell they're not going to last the night. And these are guys who are on the strip used to making 22 to $25 an hour. And why is that? It's because you get comfortable with all the accessories and the space and the light and the time and the calmness. And then you, when you walk into the kitchen at Esther's, it's a pressure cooker. And it's like, it's everything, everything has to be done right. It has to be done right now. And it's never fast enough. It's never good enough. And you're always challenging yourself and you're always pushing yourself. And on top of it, when you do it wrong, we don't yell at you. Now we just make fun of you. We're like, what do you mean you can't do that? Uh, oh, look at the guy from Robichon doesn't know how to peel a carrot. I, I, right? That's much worse. <laughs> it's much true. worse. Absolutely. <laughs> a little more damaging to the ego. Yeah. So, James, James, you referenced Robichon and strip restaurants, comparing them to Esther's Kitchen. What is What are the primary differences between strip restaurants and local places like Esther's Kitchen? Esther's is a place where you have to excel from day one and you don't have to have a pedigree. You have to have desire and you have to have a can do attitude and you have to be able to work through imperfections to get to a place 
where you have to be happy with failure every day. Robichon is a place where you learn a technique and you learn a very precise set of skills and a certain way of doing things. And we always question what we're doing in theory, in method, in execution, whereas a lot of the strip restaurants and a lot of the restaurants that have chef's names attached to them, they have a certain way they do something, and that's the only way. And whether it's Thomas Keller's way, or it's Michael Mina's way, or it's Tom Colicchio's way, or it's Robichon's way, or it's Guy Savoie's way, you then think that that is the best way. One of the great things about Esther's is, because I've worked for so many different great chefs, I can take in all the knowledge and all the different ways of doing something, and I can see where other chef's techniques come from. Like, I don't even have to eat your food. I can look at it and tell you exactly who you worked for, exactly where you learned it, and exactly what that is. And the aesthetic of the food that we put together at Esther's is completely different than all of those people. Sure. So it's more more methodical there on the strip and mechanical as to, I can imagine they're just creating the standards and cooks and, and what they do, a little less fluid and organic as in what you do at Esther's, which is, I, I would imagine, just featuring seasonal products and spontaneity and, and applying that to your food and your menus. And I think also it takes time for for young chefs and cooks to to really find their voice in food. And for me, it was working under some great chefs and, and traveling throughout Italy to really understand that, which quality of product and technique and linking it to traditional methods, uh, which some are to many classically trained cooks and chefs are somewhat unorthodox. You know, when you see a grandmother using a, a, um, a bread knife to make uh, to make orecchietti and in prepping in the kitchen only with that one knife. It's like a butter knife. And you think it's, it's blasphemy in the kitchen. It com- completely goes against everything we learned at CIA and wherever else you may be classically trained. Yet the result is life-changing, and it's soulful, delicious food. When you're creating these, these new concepts, so you, Esther's, Al Solito Posto, Ada's, how do you create or ideate these these ideas and bring them to fruition? I think it starts with the team. Because the one thing I have to realize at this point is that I'm not going to be the guy cooking the food. Like if I'm the guy cooking the food every day, we've already failed. Because that's not going to be a usable use of my time over long spans of time. And I think it's more important that I have a passion for a vision of what we want to create. And then I try to find the people who fit the vision. That is the hardest thing to do because we, it is so hard as an operator and as a chef to compare yourself to other people and then allow yourself to be like, this person is going to be better at this than I am. This person is going to be better at this part. Like they might be better at, the cooking. They might be better at the scheduling. They might be better at the ordering. They might be better at the operations. They And the thing is, you have to look at someone as a whole and not compare them to yourself, but compare them to the vision that you actually want to create inside of a business. And putting people in the right place to to build that team. Now, let me ask you, with the, the brand or the, the creation of it, El Solito Posto. So you had Esther's, very successful, arts district, downtown, rustic Italian. Now you're on to El Solito Posto. How did you come up with the idea? So it was Brio, which is a chain Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then you wanted to do, and how did you come up with El Solito Posto? What was the inspiration for that concept? How did you come to the idea? Like, this is what we need to do in this space. The greatest part about that is the menu is the easiest thing to write. The menu tells you, like you look around at the competitive set in that market and it'll tell you what people are looking for, Uh, whether they're looking for fresh pasta, whether they're looking for proteins, whether they're looking for steaks, whether they're looking for these different things. And then you create a concept 
based on something that is classical. And Osolito Posto is based on the classic Italian chop house. It is, and you're going to know this more than anybody, it is built off of all those horrible second generation Italian restaurants in New Jersey. Right? <laughs> like, so one of my. One Explain. of my memories is going to New Jersey over and over and over again, scouting for kitchen nightmares and just seeing the worst of it. So there were plenty of nightmares in New Jersey as far as You know this, <laughs> you know this, right? I do. I lived it for, yes. for 20 years right. almost. And it Jersey. wasn't the first, yes. it wasn't your restaurant. The idea of that family restaurant that served what people would in essence consider fine dining, not what I consider fine dining, because what I consider fine dining is way more cerebral than it is tactile. And just saying like, that is the concept that we want to do. So what's on that menu? Well, eggplant rollatini was on that menu. Well, we got eggplant parm. Uh, chicken parm's on that menu for sure. Rigatoni al vodka on the menu, absolutely. Linguine and clams on that menu, definitely, right? Is there a steak on there? Yeah, veal chop, absolutely. Like, like that menu rounds itself out very quickly. And the hardest part was to find out what not to put on that menu and editing. Cause we could have done an 85 uh, item menu very easily and then just be overwrought. And then it's just paring it down, putting it into the machine, which is the R and D machine, which is going back and telling yourself that you're not, that's not like you do the artist thing, right? You have an idea, you put it in front of yourself, and you say it's not good enough. And you just keep doing that over and over and over and over. <laughs> so Al Solito Posto stylistically is like an Italian-American restaurant, but done well, high-quality yes. products. Yes. And technique. along, And you make your own, all of your own pastas there just yes. as, as Esther's, right? Yep. Yeah. I've eaten there. It's, it's really great. It, so James, what about... It, so Ada's, tell me how you came up with the wine bar concept. It's not Italian. It's not tapas. Is it more like chef-driven small plates? You could definitely call it, I call it wine-centric small plates mm -hmm. because I think chef-driven connotates the idea that there's some mad chef in there trying to put zucchini flowers with, you know, some crazy other ingredient and it's going to look like it's unsubstantial. So like a, a chef driven ship without a rudder. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then like, and I think when you hear chef driven, that's what you always kind of con contate is someone who is just doing whatever they want. And where are they taking me? Exactly. And what, what your name I'm about to go on. So Ada's is a, uh, a wine bar and it's based off of, the idea that in that space, in Tivoli Village, there is an awesome group of people in that community who love wine, and we feel like they're underserved. And what we want to do is bring a new look at an old favorite, which is the wine bar. The wine bar usually go in, they have huge list, lots of stuff at the bottom, lots of stuff at the top, not really a lot of stuff in the middle. And it's like, hey, I'm here for a glass of Pinot. I'm here for a glass of Chard. Well, if you come in and you come in wanting a glass of Chardonnay, we're going to have a great $12 white Burgundy for you that we sourced and we've worked on and we've actually put effort into to make sure that that wine speaks to you in a way that's great. When I worked at Le Bernardin, I got to make the salmon riette with Eric every day. It has creme fraiche and aioli and tarragon and tons of chives and it's medium rare and it's like beautiful and it's perfect in its essence and bringing that and putting it with Esther's bread and serving that to you. That's what I want to have with my glass of Chardonnay. Let's talk about restaurant location. How do you go about choosing the right location in any market? <laughs> so it's really hard because um, you have to rely on not just intuition, but you have to have a sense of um, what you're looking for to get out of the business. And this is any business. If it's a business that's gonna thrive in a strip mall, then by all means, look at strip malls. Um, what I took away from 
the book when I read uh, Noma. Um, I didn't take away the fermented plum recipe or this or that. What I took away is that restaurants are time and place. And time and place are the most important factors when choosing a, a restaurant space and or an area to go into. Um, in order to be successful in a restaurant, uh, you either have to have a homogenized concept going into a high traffic area, or you have to have a very non-homogenized concept going into a low traffic area with potential. If you're doing one of those two things, you have an opportunity for success. If you're doing something besides that, you are not going to be successful. We all know that. Sure. Um, because the heavily dense uh, business areas and the more expensive area you're looking at, you're looking at higher operational costs, higher um, labor costs, higher uh, food costs. You're looking at a whole bunch of different things. When you're looking at a restaurant like Esther's, when we got into uh, my lease, I got my lease at $1.30 a square foot. Now, when you're talking about the space I was looking that I was at in LA before was at seven dollars a square foot plus plus, which is plus triple nets. Um, then you're looking at about ten dollars a square foot a month for occupancy, or one hundred and twenty dollars a year per square foot. Now those kind of numbers, when you start breaking that into your PNL and you start looking at the actual granular uh, bits of that, now you're deep. Now you know that you have to make X amount of dollars and you have to make X amount of check average and X amount of guests in order to what we call theoretically break even. What we do wrong in this business traditionally, and we all know this, is that our goal is to break even. If I told you that I wanted to just open a restaurant and I wanted to do $5 million a year and I just wanted to break even. Why are you doing it? Exactly. Right. <laughs> that's, but that's, that's but why, so why is our goal always break even? Yeah, there's many ways we can do this and look at it. I think, how do you think, the key thing is identity. What do you feel about the way I, I see many restaurateurs or wannabe restaurateurs going into a market without having a, their identity figured out? Right. Clear vision of who they are and what they're bringing to the guests. What do you think about that? What's well, I think, I think it'd be like if I walked into an all-Indian neighborhood serving Italian food... I would be foolish to bring that there. Um, I also know that if you looked at the number of Italian restaurants that were in Vegas and I told you I was opening an Italian restaurant, you'd be like, why are you opening an Italian restaurant? There's tons of them out there. And why is Esther's going to be different or better? And if I quantified those things by saying, we're going to use locally sourced ingredients, locally sourced plates, locally sourced um, flour, locally sourced... Uh, everything. And then on top of it, we're going to make everything in house that we can make. We're going to build everything in house that we can build. We're going to like, you'd be like, why are you doing all that? When the guy across the street is selling chicken parm for $24. And you're like, because that's not the kind of Italian food that we're doing. Right. It has to be a restaurant has to fit somewhere and be special for a community in some way, whether or not, that serves a lunch crowd or a dinner crowd, whether or not that serves a guest at $70 a check average, $120 a check average, $50 a check average, $40 a check average, $8 a check average. Like there's a way to make it all work. Now you have to be smart enough as an entrepreneur to realize that you are going to have to build something that is special to somebody. Because if you do what everyone else does, then you're just the same, right? That, and that, you, not, you need differentiators. You and, have to have the identity, and, but you also have to have other parts of it that are special. Like, or you have to make it special. Like, I mean, that's one of the things that I find is the crazy thing that people are opening restaurants and they're trying to just be like everybody else. You have an opportunity in the beginning of your, of your life cycle as a restaurant to, to, People will all come in. They'll kick the tires. You're always busy the first three months because you're new, yep. whether you figured out who you are or not. And that's the opportunity to, to get them in. If you f Now more than ever, if you don't hit on all these points, like hospitality, quality of food, speed of service, pricing, the, the entire experience, right. you're going to lose people quickly and they won't come back. Um, I think people are, people are expecting from day one when you open for everything to be perfect. And... 
one of the things that I have built in to lower that expectation is I literally go to them and apologize. I'm like, whatever we piss you off with tonight, just know that we're working on it. And please give me feedback and let me know. That's good. And what I do is I invite them to be a part of a communication channel that other experiences don't give them. Yeah, I think it's important to be upfront and honest. Yet yes. it is, and they understand and appreciate that. Rather than, I've been to restaurants too, and I'm sure you have as well, where you go, it's imperfect, they open, and they want to ignore you. The, the owner, the manager, the servers don't come near yep. you because they're terrified, and they just don't know what to do. I think it's mm -hmm. the worst thing that you can do. Yet being transparent and saying, hey, we're new, and showing some vulnerability, you, you kind of get people on your side. Uh, I, I do think it's important for restaurants to invest more time in training, like you did at El Solito Posto. You mm -hmm. trained for weeks before you were public. And, and I'll tell you another thing that I know. A friend of mine has many restaurants on the East Coast, and what they do, for, which I think is interesting and which I've never done, is the first two weeks of opening, they'll, they'll have people come in as paying diners, and you don't know until you pay the check, but you're charged only 50% because mm -hmm. they say, this is their way of saying, hey, welcome to our restaurant. We're happy to have you. We're not perfect. And it's not, doesn't, it doesn't, everyone pays 50%. It doesn't matter how good or bad the experience was. Even if it's a perfect experience, probably not in an opening. And it creates so much goodwill for them. I think it's a brilliant idea. More than ever, now everyone is a restaurant critic, critic and pro. Yeah. They have high expectations. They walk yeah. in. It is a few things it does. It, it one is builds goodwill. It makes friends. They understand. They're more forgiving and less apt to go on any of the social media platforms, whether it's Open Table or or, or your favorite and mine, Yelp. Yeah, I mean, like, and leave a, a bad review, <laughs> right? You know, the worst part is, is that so and we es live and die by these. Esther's Kitchen made the top one hundred restaurants in the country from Yelp. Like, <laughs> yes. and, and I hate Yelp with a fervent passion. Did because you refuse the award? Did you, did you send it back? It's not you like, it's not like they sent me a gold it... statue or something, but, but real, like, yeah, but <laughs> they sent me one of their like little stand up and check in things. No, um, I, I really dislike the, I think there's a level of dishonesty in their business model that I don't appreciate. Well, sure. and, and it's just something that like, where like people who have never been to the restaurant, could critique it and they're allowed to do that on their True. platform and they i mean we've had we've had many things where someone got hung up on on accident from a hostess who was like really really busy and hit the wrong button and hit hang up instead of hold and we ended up with a one-star yelp review for someone who never came to the restaurant yeah it's, it's, and then so like and then like then there are times that i know that we have really messed things up for a guest and they left furious and they didn't leave a review. So, I mean, like, it, it really is such a, a random roll of the dice thing. And it's so hard to control. But the things you can control is how you respond. And the, in the past, if, if someone was out of their box, I have been known to light them up publicly, very, very publicly. And I do that on purpose. So I'm like, dude, I'm like, think about what this does to the psyche of a restaurateur. Think about what it does to a group of people who worked really, really hard to give you the expectation. I, like, I remember our first one story up review at Esther's so clearly. It was some freaking douchebag from New York who, who ordered, who ordered butternut squash agnolotti. It's gotta be a New Yorker. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I know Italian food. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. You yeah. Know that, right? I, I know it's Italian okay. food. Right. That's I'm, not, a, yeah, I'm, I'm a transplant. I've, I've been yeah. everywhere. So. You're Jersey. Uh, you're Jersey. You're, oh, you're, you're oh Jersey. geez. Thanks. <laughs> but you're like the good even, Jersey. Even more complimentary. Yeah. That's even better. Even, okay. Yeah, you're like good, good Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. like, for me, it's like this guy came in and said, oh, you're putting a squash agnolotis. They're not sweet. I'm like, burn a squash is a vegetable. It's not sweet. And they're like, well, well, you know, it doesn't have like the Amari breadcrumbs on it. It doesn't have like, it was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, it says brown butter and squash. Like it tastes like squash, doesn't it? It tastes like the vegetable squash. He's like, yeah, but it doesn't taste like, you know, the sweet butternut squash that I'm used to. I'm like, yeah, it's because you eat, put brown sugar on your squash and then you do it. And I was like, you know what, dude? I was like, you don't need to eat any more food. He's like, what? I was like, you're done. He's like, you're not allowed to order any more food. In fact, your bill's on me. You guys have a nice night. 
He's like, can I talk to the owner? I'm like, I am the owner. I, I'm like, I I'm wearing this. a dish. I'm wearing a dishwasher jacket, right? I'm saying, <laughs> you know, go out to the table. This guy sent back three pastas. Ah, oh, your pasta doesn't taste fresh. I was like, it's literally made every day. The, what this guy wanted was pre-cooked pasta with sauce on top of it. He's like, why is it all red? Why do you mix the sauce? I was like, I was like, I was like. You New Yorkers think you know everything about everything. I was like, you're the worst. I was like, get out of my restaurant. Did you throw a bar stool at him too? No, 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 I did not. No, <laughs> no, no, that was only one person. <laughs> um, and and what it was is the next day, I pulled up Yelp on my phone in pre-shift. I said, guys, guess what? We got our first one-star Yelp review. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, pulled out a ball of champagne. Popped it. I was like, hey, man, if we're going to get them, this is the perfect way to get them. Because that means we're not doing it. What everyone else is doing, we're not homogenizing. We're not acquiescing to people who think they know how my fucking restaurant should be. <laughs> and we also shouldn't be afraid of telling people who we are and what we believe in. And that's what Esther's is about. And if I had a nickel for every time someone came into one of my concepts or wanted to partner with us and would state like we want this like this and compare with these like everyone else it was just yeah this isn't the right fit and it's not what we do so no. i commend you for standing your ground yeah. and, and upholding your well i mean your it, your, your restaurant values and, and that's and the identity. reason why i made broke i mean i've broken partnerships i had a partnership with uh one of the hotels here i had one conversation with their COO and and it was literally just like I had absolutely no want or need to ever do business with those people again because their values and my values were so different about like how I felt we should be able to talk honestly like if you can't talk honestly with your partners but these people with these giant hotels all they want you to do is one thing they want you to do what they want you to do. Sure. Right? And that's not that's yeah. not what we're built to do. Yeah. They'll court you for your name and your identity. They'll yeah. get you in and then they'll want you to change and do what they want. Now, yeah. so what I've learned too, and I've experienced that myself and, and had partnerships that didn't work out with, with corporations, hotels, casinos. And the idea is to really understand in the importance of understanding who you're getting into bed with in yeah. business. And making sure that your ideals and values and morals are aligned and under, and really vetting that out. Absolutely. Before you and and a lot of people, it's very attractive the money they offer you up front and throughout the partnership. It sure it's is. It's game changing. It's life changing. It's life changing. And it's really hard to say no. But after doing that and having that experience, now yep. you know. Now I know is to say no to that because it's it's short term, whatever, maybe financial I don't want to say loss, just not having that. But long-term, really, peace and, and getting into... It's really, it's about dividing up your energy into the partnerships and things that really bring you joy yeah. and have a long-term value. And that's not always... It's, it's right. not always monetary. It's not always about the money. Let's talk about the future of hospitality. How do you see it going for the restaurant model, even pre-COVID? It's a broken model. And I say that... And in that, it's it's hard, notoriously hard for restaurants to make money. And now with the the idea of the looming the the, the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, how do you see it changing for us as an industry? The biggest challenges that we have in this industry are the balance, not within our industry, but within the categories of the haves and have nots, and. The front of the house versus back of the house thing, it will always be there as long as people are not paid on the same wage scale. Like, it's never made any sense to me that someone with almost no training makes three times what someone with $80,000 in school debt has dealt with. Do you think we could ever reverse that? Yes. And there are ways of doing it, and there are ways of changing. Um, there's ways of changing the way we run restaurants at a very granular level, but it would have to be industry-wide and it would have to be culturally accepted. 
it's culturally accepted that a white female mid twenties person can make three hundred dollars a day serving, but it's also culturally appropriate that someone who's thirty five been doing it for twenty years can work in the back for fourteen dollars an hour. And that is a cultural norm that has to change. Like we have to put in the change that we want to see. So what we did at Esther's and the way we started it is we started with the round of beers. And we didn't make it egregious and we just kind of put it on the bottom of the menu. If you want to tip the kitchen, here's how you do it. And so, so by purchasing, so buying them a round of beers yeah, means It's just you're give tipping tip. the kitchen. And what we do is like you pay sales tax on it. I pay income tax on it, but all $6 goes into a pot. And then we split that between the dishwashers, the cooks and the pastry cooks all evenly. So does that, I, I think it's a good idea and it, it, it's an idea with merit, but it surely doesn't level it up though. It doesn't yet. I think what the next thing that we have to do is we know the $15 an hour minimum wage thing is coming, but once the minimum wage is $15 an hour. Who wants to work for minimum wage? Let me ask you this. So I agree. And in Europe, if you take our model, the American model, mm -hmm. cooks get paid by the hour, servers get paid less by the hour, but get tips. And Americans are accustomed to leaving 18 to 20%, let's say, right? Depending on the quality of service. But even yep. now, even with mediocre service, most Americans are just conditioned to leave an 18 to 20% tip. Yes even out of the sense of guilt or like that's what they're supposed to do. It's a cultural norm. However, it is a cultural norm. In Europe, the servers and cooks get a salary and it's the same. Yeah. Very close. Again, there's there's differences in tenure and, and so on and so forth and experience where you might start at a higher level depending on the position. And only here, we put the onus on our customers to leave that tip. In Europe, it's not required mm -hmm. and they leave a couple of euro right which maybe. is the equivalent of 2 to 4 dollars maybe yeah. on on a, on a check and and again this is why Europeans European restaurants love American tourists because right. <laughs> even while whilst abroad we are we we we, we, we bring our cultural we bring norms our cultural to them. norms to them <laughs> yeah. and which which they're good with but you know the funny thing is that there's also the exact opposite stigma because the one table you don't want in a restaurant is the german speaking table because sure. you know, doesn't matter how much they ask you for, how much you do for them, they get, are not leaving you a penny. You're getting two dollars. <laughs> yeah. It, so let's. And, and let's, our, the difference is, is that our service is affected in America to that table, whereas if we go to Europe, they still treat us like crap, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> not in Italy. Come on. It's, all right. Well, let's unpack this a little bit here and. With, with knowing this, where our cultural norm is the way it is and, and, and cooks, restaurant margins are very slim. We really can't charge more for our food. The cost of, of, of goods are all going up. How do, we, how, do we, how do we fix this? How do we get to the next level? I mean, I, I would be remiss if I said that we couldn't charge more for the food at, at Esther's. We could charge more for the food at Esther's and also Lido, and I believe people would pay it. Um, I think if you raise what we do by 20%, I think we're still, I think we go down in covers by about 5%, and I think it levels out, and we actually end up making more money. But how does that money then translate to getting to the employees of the restaurant? That's the real question. It's like if there was a bigger slice of the pie, would the owner just take more of the slice of pie or would the onus be on them to then give back to their staff? Cause I know that there are a lot of restaurants, especially steakhouses that put down millions of dollars of profit while continuing that cultural norm and not paying up to their guests or not paying up to their, to their employees. Now that is something that we have to look at. If you're in a business like a fine dining like or true fine dining restaurant and you're at a 5%, you know, 5% uh, profit margin, then 
you really have to keep that as tight as possible. And you're at the onus of one or two guests a night in those, in those businesses, whether or not you're breaking even or losing money. Those are not real businesses. Those are passion projects. And we have to treat them like passion projects sure. because like if a linea that's supposed to do 135 covers a night does 127 covers a night, they lose money. Sure. Now, it, it, so there's there's quite a difference here between smaller, chef-driven, passion projects, right. low-grossing restaurants, that these are the ones that really struggle, versus a steakhouse uh, on the strip or a strip restaurant that's grossing 15 to 25 million. Right. That's extremely profitable, and that we could go further down. They, they don't pay rent in, in, in many cases in there, right. where the small <laughs> restaurants are paying all the taxes, the rent, the labor, the utilities are enormous. Yes, I guess the caveat or the danger is is the balancing between providing great product and value and service, and charging more for the food. If you the problem, it, the issue is if you charge more for the food, people don't come back because they can't afford it as often, and then you become known as a special occasion restaurant right. where they're not coming which is, weekly which is the or biweekly. They're coming a local restaurant. quarterly or, or six mm -hmm. monthly. But yep. how has failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? It is. I thought about this and I think about failure a lot because there's no, I think you fail every day and you feel better. But when you talk about something that, you can pour a lot of time and effort and fail every day. And so failure, learn, iterate. Failure, learn, iterate, but more importantly, fail, think, iterate. Hmm. Fail and then meditate. Fail and then, but the thing is, like, I, I got, especially with Ada's, I got into a very negative habit of beating myself up saying, why can't I make this work? And we looked at it, and I can look at it from a financial perspective and see it would never work unless I was there all the time, and it needed me to be there and my chefs to be there 14 to 16 hours a day in the way it was iterated. And we were there, and we were set up, and we were running the mechanics of it, but we were failing every day. And it's hard to fail every day. So you say you had to be there for the hours. It sounds like, so the revenue, the amount of coverage you could do within a certain period and the revenues mm -hmm. weren't high enough to support the staff, to hire more staff. So it's really more like a, a, a little cottage business where it would be better exactly. run by a, an owner. Well, it would be better run if we took away the specialness of it. Mm -hmm. But I refuse to take, like as a chef and as an owner, I didn't want to lose the specialness of that opportunity. I also didn't want to let my partner down. It was the first time I was working with a partner, and I didn't want to show him that I left anything on the table. If I left it on the table, it's my failure. <laughs> you know, and that's the way I really felt. And I hear it's it's always easy to blame yourself and beat yourself up, and it's never a way to, to especially find when when never you're a tortured to artist like we are. Find your way out. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's very easy to do. What, what's been the most influential event in your life? Uh, probably the car accident I had in 2005. Um, I was working at Alizé. Uh, I had been, I think it was on like day like 28 or 29 straight. Uh, Alizé in 2005, we won a Michelin star. Um, we wanted to maintain that. We were at the top of the Palms on the 52nd floor, and I was the uh, demi-chef on fish, which meant that I was creating three new fish dishes every single day. Um, I had a lot. The, it was a beautiful, one of my favorite restaurants I've ever worked at. I got to work with Jacques Van Staten, who's South African and was the uh, chef de cuisine for Jean-Louis Paladin. And he was Legendary. crazy. Great chef. He, he's great. Paladin. I love him. Paladin was great. Jacques is great. But like, you would get done with 175 covers, and at the end of it, you'd be doing push-ups after you cleaned your station. It was that kind of restaurant, and we loved it. And it was young guys, and that, like the guys who I cooked with there are still all my friends. Kyle Johnson, Andrew Waterman, Les Goodman, um, I mean, you know, Michael Von Staten, uh, Casey, who was our Carmage guy, who was like 85. You know, even the pastry cooks, Raquel and uh, Chef Tammy. Like, I mean, like those guys were amazing and we were just like 
thick as thieves and we were all in it. And I was on like, like I said, I didn't take days off. So I was on, on like day 28 or 29 straight, a 14 to 16 hour days. I got in my car, drove home, fell asleep and drove into a wall. And I broke my neck, my back, my shoulder blades, my collarbone, my wrists, my legs, my ribs, dislocated my pelvis. I, my arms still don't go straight. Like, I mean, like, I messed myself up. Yeah, and it made me look that's at... That's a serious accident. It also made me look at what, what I wanted in life. So what changed? What, what did you do? What was the result of that? I got better. Better I, 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 I told myself, if I can recover from that, nothing can stop me. I'm here for a reason. I don't know what that reason is, but I'm going to keep moving forward with it. And I wanted to cook. Like the first thing I wanted to do when I got out of the hospital was go back to work. Career. It sounds like that you really were in tune, or you developed your own personal morals and values. Well, it changed what my journey was about. It changed it from being about all about me, about being all about the restaurant, which then changed the way I looked at my relationship with other people inside the restaurant business. Because when I was young, I was extremely cocky. I was extremely competitive. I was extremely ungrateful. I thought I had to, I, I looked at someone else and saw what I wanted. By the way, I remember. Oh yeah. Oh, well, you, I was 15. <laughs> I didn't even know anything. <laughs> well, uh, just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. You were but, great. You know, but the thing was, is like, I had all that. And, and when, after the accident, it was more about like, I get to go be a part of this team or I get to go learn this and wow, what a cool thing to see. And it was a different experience and it led me to, and then I got to the place where, uh, which didn't work. Uh, and this was kind of another pivotal kind of thing, which was when I got to San Francisco and I was working for Crystal Hamadou at Michael Mina. Uh, Anthony Karen, who's one of my great friends and who was the corporate chef for Michael Mina, sent me to San Francisco to be a sous chef at Michael Mina. I got there, that chef was the exact opposite of every single thing that I stand for. He was cocky, he was arrogant, he was rude, he was horrible to his cooks. He's not someone I would want to ever look up to. He had all the skills and all the technique and just that wrapped in being the worst kind of person. How did that play out? What did you do? Did you, I, did, did you make a decision like this? I ended up throwing like a chair this? at him in the middle of the restaurant and left. Okay, so you realize this isn't for you and that no. who I am and what I stand for is more important. No, and than I this thought and if I worked harder and I just did, I, I, did, I was working 14, 16, 17, 18 hours a day in a basement with some dragon lady. You, you can't ask you can't, right. you I, can't ask for more than that and the yeah. dragon lady. Wow. No, no, and, and, then, and then one day he calls me up and he just called me up to chew me out. Like, he called me up intentionally just to ruin my day. Like, just to be a dick to me. And I was like, I'm fucking tired of this, right? And I, I don't deserve to be treated like this. And I'm out of here. It's not worth it. And he said something to me. And I literally picked up one of the dining chairs at the Michael, in Michael Mina. And I threw it at him. And I hit him with it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm going to get my stuff and leave now. Bye. And don't he, mess with James. No, well, he's lucky. As someone growing up in a hotel in Las Vegas, you're told... You want to be executive chef of a hotel. That's the goal. And now I see that as a fool's errand. For me, it was became not something that I would want. Not something you would aspire to. Right. I, so, yes, I, I see it as people in as grand as those positions can be, executive chef, vice president of food and beverage, or what have you, if you're not within the right culture where they really care for their people, it can, it can be a thank thankless, grueling job. And I've seen many executives just get through their careers and just long to retire. And for me personally, and I think for you, if I can assume, is that that's, that's just not the way you want to live. No. You want to extract more meaning from your daily life and feel like you have impact and, and, and to help others to achieve their goals. What are bad recommendations you hear in our profession? Stability. <laughs> Stability is um, is a trap. It's a trap because along with those wonderful people who want to provide for them, what they also need is they need the security in their business to make sure that that salad gets made every day by that same person. 
Um, and so they create these little traps. And I think money is a trap. Money is a trap. Stability is a trap. Um, stability. I th- what do you mean by stability is a trap? Can you like, give an example? Like uh, my goal as a chef was always to learn the most. I always wanted to, to, to be seeking. And that meant like unlike a lot of cooks, I left the job every year, year and a half. I just like, I right, cool. I, I know how to like, Michael, I know all your dishes. Great. Boom. Bradley, I, I know all your dishes. You know, Heston, I know how to cook all your food. Eric, I know how to cook all your food. Great. Awesome. You got nothing left to teach me? I got somewhere to go. And so that's what I said. So like as a young cook, you just want to expose yourself to a bunch of different styles and and to to teach yourself so many different ways. Um, and so stability is a trap. So stability, stability is a in the fiber. sense that go get a job, get yeah. get into a union, do the same thing, yep. and move on. It's for it's, me. For me, that's yeah, a trap. Um, sure. and, and I think that's and I think that's one thing that like that's bad advice for someone who should be inquisitive and is a craftsperson. And there is not just one way to build a chair. You know, there like there's a bunch of different ways to build these chairs, and the more ways you know how the more useful you are at building chairs. And that's what I think we do as restaurateurs is we just build chairs. Yeah, right? it's, it's a fluid business. It's, it's constantly evolving and you have to stay mm-hmm. up with the times. And over your career, you'll need to, in many ways, reinvent yourself, whether it's right. situationally, ge- 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 geographically, within your position or what you need to learn or within cuisines and even as business people, managers, business people running the show. There's also this other part of it that we don't really talk about, which is the influx of technology into our lives in a way that is not helpful. When I came up, if I wanted to learn how to cook something, I had to go work for you, and I had to go learn what you do to make something that was special. And then I had to go to the next chef and learn that and go to the next chef and learn that. And that was the kind of the stage premise that people were going around Europe and going to different restaurants to learn different techniques to round out their craft. Now I can jump on YouTube and watch you do a video of it or watch me do a video of it or watch Chef Mark Vetri do a video of it. James, what's the next chapter in your career story? So I started off as a cook and then I became a chef and then I became a corporate chef and then I became an owner and now I am an operator so I think at this point, I'm an operator, and I'm a multi-unit operator. So now I have to be a team builder, not a person with a tactile function. I have a different job that I now need to learn, which is restaurateur. And restaurateur is different than chef. Like, I look at great chefs like Eric Repair, Danielle Ballou, those guys, right? Like, they're Chef Ballou, Chef Thomas Keller right? They don't cook. Like if I'm cooking, I'm wasting my time. I know that. I need to be pushing other people to getting them in the right place to create what we want to create, to create a space that will operate in a way that is functional and beautiful for people to enjoy. So now I'm a restaurateur. Okay, that's my job. Now, the weirdest part about this is I have a set of skills. I have a very refined set of skills. I have a very, very high level set of skills in one part of that. That does not mean I understand the rest of it. So I am actually spending my time being inquisitive, asking in front of the house operators how they run their business, how they run their labor schedules, how they do these things, how they run their tip schedules, how they like, so that way I can get a better sense of rounding out my set of skills to allow me to be a multi-platform operator who doesn't get pigeonholed into one thing. We beat ourselves up in this business to a level that most people don't understand. Like I hurt every day. It's true. I, I did it for many years, many mm-hmm. years. And I think we, we all think in our industry that there's so much, and there is so much output. You need to be dedicated. You need to do this. You need to be better. Work 12, 16 hours a day. Yet we, we fail to recognize the input. Input to me is recovery, right? Right. So 
we're more than just who we are. Chef. Uh, I don't view myself as a chef or restaurateur. I view myself right. as, as, as now, at least now, fast forward to where I'm at in my life. I'm a human being first. And yeah. I have other interests than, than doing this. And I realized that through all those years and pain and hours and, and neglecting my self-care. And now I realize that self-care is the most important thing you can give yourself because from there, taking care of yourself, you can take care of others, right? And it, it, it expands into so many different arenas into your life. And the crazy thing is, like, you, we, we laugh about it because we know it's true. Like, you're right. It is every holiday. It is every, every barbecue, every Saturday night, every date night, every everything. You, like, I gave up all of it. People ask me, like, what'd you do in your 20s? I was like, I worked. I literally, I just worked. Sure. Your, I imagine your 20s, much like mine, were a blur. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you, you, you work until you are so exhausted, the only thing you can do is drink, and then you drink so you can pass out, and then you wake up to do it all over again. And you don't just do that for like what, what people would consider a three-day bender. Well, I went on a 20-year bender, right? <laughs> all addicted to this thing that we do as chefs, which is the, the life of a cook and the life of a chef is addictive. It's addictive in every possible way. It is. And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll look back and, and good habits need to be instilled every yeah. single day. And long term, big picture, you'll look back. And I was, I was the same. I was unhealthy and unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I remember periods of time in my career where I had some great successes. And I, I didn't stop even for a moment to celebrate them. I right. just looked at it like, okay, what's next? And then I was on and I didn't appreciate those moments. And yeah. As where I stand now, I'm regretful for that. And I know I'm going super forward, I won't do that mm -hmm. as I'll be more present. There's all these different things that feed into all these different things I'm passionate about that have nothing to do with restaurants. But social activism is necessary at a certain point for some of us. A lot of, a lot of our priors, like I know you and uh, a lot of the other people say you need to stay out of those things. You did not let your opinion be known. I kind of feel the opposite. Well, and I found that like, I found that being neutral is acquiescing to some things that I would see as things I wouldn't want to see happen in the world around me. It could be. I think that let's, let's unpack this a minute here. Yeah. I, I, or whenever I'd advise you to, I didn't advise you to not participate. It's how you participate right. and how you express yourself. Right. I, I, I agree. Don't acquiesce. Don't be neutral because right. you're just as guilty as anyone else. Exactly. For not participating. Yes. Right. And, and and what I'd say is I take the I take you, the information like if you it, take the high yeah. road and express yourself right. with park the anger. Speak from a higher place. Talk intelligently about your position and your views and make it about the issue and not the people involved. Attack right. the issues and have these debates and conversations without making people your enemies. True. Right? I think that's that's yeah. the way I, I look I, and this try is to Yelp approach. Review 101. Right? And, this, and this wasn't and this wasn't yeah. always how yeah. I was I was structured. It took focus for me to realize this and to not make people enemies and realize that right. we can have honest, good disagreements and talk through it and staying open to other people's perspectives and views and still 100%. respecting them because many times they're very intelligent people. Don't shut them out because of your past conditioning or your beliefs right? because those will always betray you and that you'll yeah. never, without being open, you'll never gain the information that's really out there for you. So you'll become right. a better... And, and there there are a lot of... there. There's definitely something about not demonizing someone who you uh, don't agree with. And that's something even as a chef, like I remember when, like, you know, back in the nineties before we had videos and you could see the depth of like character on people is that, um, we used to demonize other chefs for like, Oh, look at what he's doing over there. What a hack or the, what this guy or that guy. Well, you know what? Maybe they didn't have the, 
the resources to do something as nice as you did, or maybe they didn't have the ability or, or access to product or do this or, or do that or that. Or maybe they yeah. were really good and you were just jealous yeah. and that you, you were insecure of your own abilities and you wanted to be where so they were. And that. for me, I was that way plenty of times Yeah, and no more. And it's, it's good to not Growth. be that way. So, Growth. Growth, Growth is good. It, and that's is. one of those things that comes from mindfulness is growth. <laughs> that's true. Here's the growth. Who who's the most overrated celebrity chef? All of them. They all, all suck. Them. Okay. They all suck. I mean, like, really, I've met them all. And they're, like, they're just so... In order to be a celebrity chef, you have to be an egomaniac. And that is not something that I'm interested in. The people who I'm interested in are people like Eric who aren't celebrity chefs. He's a chef. There's no celebrity involved with him. He's just so good. He surpasses all those people without even trying, without doing all the other so things. He doesn't need to succumb to celebrity chefdom. No, he doesn't have to but, like make his hair all spiky or over pronunciate stupid Italian words. This is sort of <laughs> like who? Like who? Like who? Giada. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I knew right? you were going there. Yeah. So I just wanted, yeah, to, yeah, I wanted like, to, you know, to like, extract it for I, our listeners here. Exactly. If you could broadcast or skywrite a message or quote that everyone could see, what would it be? Be grateful every day. We have so much to be grateful for in this business. We have the opportunity to do such beautiful things and we should be grateful for it. They should not be a burden. Your ability to influence other people, to make other people's day, to get to do what we do every day is a gift. It is not a burden. That's really beautiful. I, I love that. Okay, now let's enter the plug zone. Tell us where people can find you, James. Uh, Facebook is, or everything is basically at James Trees. Um, we're working on a website for me because apparently I need a website. Oh, yes. I'm like, okay, cool, website. All the star chefs, all the celebrity chefs have. Yeah, you know, it, well, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, you know, when they line those people up, I don't make that list. Um, but really it's just <laughs> at James trees on, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, obviously the restaurants are Esther's kitchen LV on Instagram, also little posto on Instagram and Ada's A D A S. Um, and yeah, simple. Great. It, thank you. And for our listeners out there, we will add James info to our show notes as well. James, this has really been fun for me. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Luke. it's been a pleasure. To all of our audience out there, thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Future of Hospitality podcast.